Hey guys, what's up? It is uh, week 113. Uh, right off the bat, I want to let you guys know this is probably uh, the last week or the last day if you're seeing this to enter a Friday, Saturday is probably your cutoff line to enter the American Horror Project Volume 2 prize. Uh, well, the contest or whatever and win a tote bag and oop, this bad boy right here, the American Horror Project Volume 2 it has three movies on there. I've talked about it to death, so I reviewed it a few weeks ago. I've been talking about it in the contest. All you got to go to is ScreamingToiletContest at gmail.com and uh, United uh, North America only, please. So uh, go ahead and entries, I mean, go ahead and shoot an email if you want to be entered in the contest, and uh, I'll draw for it um, Friday or Saturday. So when you're seeing this next week, this is pretty much the cutoff So to enter. Anyways, I guess I'm going to draw for... For my Patreons right now for uh, the Brain Damage, my June Patreons for Brain Damage Blue right here. So if you don't, if you're not a patron, you don't want to watch this stuff. Go ahead and skip ahead to the reviews. But I guess we'll do this right away. And if you want to be a Patreon, all the information will be below. So go ahead and click that link. See who's gonna win this bad boy. Who do we got here? I see the name. My hand get my fat hand can't get out of there. We got Derek Bourgeois. So uh, Derek B, awesome guy, has a YouTube channel of his own and a, a podcast of his own, Cinema Attack. Or yeah, so check that out if you're interested, and uh, give me your uh, address, and I'll send it right away. Uh, let me hop into. You know what? I'm gonna open this up with kind of a, a quickie review. This is gonna be quick. I saw it in the theaters at Midsummer. Yeah, I'm, I'm a try, spoiler free review, very quick review here. Uh, this is by the director of Hereditary, obviously. I thought Hereditary was good. I thought the ending was a little uh, strange to me. I didn't love the ending of it. Um, I don't want to get into details because I'm talking about Midsommar here. I went and saw this movie, and um, I'm going to be honest, I love this movie. Uh, it opens up with something that hits really close to home for me. If anybody knows, uh, you know, uh, the stuff with happened with my family and everything like that, it hits very close to home. It almost killed me in the opening of the movie, and I swear this director is trying to kill me with his films. It feels like it at times, which is, uh, you know, it, it is definitely a compliment, not an insult, because a powerful movie is a powerful movie nonetheless. But this movie uh, deals with loss, and it's one of these dark dramas that has these horror elements. Obviously, if anybody's looked into it a little bit, they know that it involves some sort of rituals and stuff like that involving, you know, other countries' kind of deals and how they see things and sex and kind of cults. Uh, obviously very similarity to like stuff like Wicker Man. Uh, I thought this movie was visual storytelling at its finest. They showed many things. Uh, they didn't hit you over the head with it. They set everything up wonderfully. Like I said, visual filmmaking at its finest. The acting was top notch. The musical score and the sound design was perfect. The camera shots were wonderful. There's a scene uh, in here where you can tell it's a transition to cross over into the next world. And I was like, why are they doing that? And I was like, okay, I understand now. It's, it's kind of perfect. They incorporate a lot of kind of trippy things in here as well and there's dark comedic elements in here and uh they work really well and then i noticed in the theater there was a lot of uncomfortable laughter during during sexual scenes in the movie and uh that kind of was like okay i know that people are uncomfortable they laugh but it was kind of surprising that people were laughing like little kids at times um some of the humor, like I said, works well and it's in there and everything like that. I don't really have any complaints about this movie. I thought it was superbly well acted. I thought it was perfect and I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was genuinely great. Uh, the special effects are great. The camera work is great. The emotion is great. The story is great. It's everything that I look for in a new film. And uh, I do, you know, everybody for a long time had been saying, we're in a rena whole renaissance, whole renaissance. Like, okay, I see a couple movies I love a year, but this one is first one in a long time that I was like, man, that really hit very close to me and I think it was really great and I think it's probably my favorite movie that I saw this year to be honest that came out uh Midsommar I loved it uh and it all takes place during the day which is a rarity in horror films which is pretty unique pretty cool I would say check it out in theaters it's different it's not something you would see every day highly recommended great stuff uh, check out the trailer I told you that I want to go to that festival in Sweden no you said it would be cool to go yeah, and then I got the opportunity and I decided Look, I to do it. I don't mind you going. I just wish you would have told me. That's all. Dude, she needs a therapist. You've been wanting out of this stupid relationship for like a year now. And don't forget about all of the beautiful Swedish women you meet in June. Okay, guys. That's not her again. Seriously? Babe, what's happening? Danny. 
I was so very sorry to hear about what happened. I'm sorry. I invited Danny to come to Sweden. You know what she's been going through? Christian says you've got this special week planned. It's sort of a crazy festival. Special ceremonies and dressing up. That sounds fun. Unbelievable. Welcome and happy midsummer. School! What time is it? 9 p.m. That can't be right. The sky is blue. This is what 9 p.m. is like here. <laughs> How long have you two been together? Just over three and a half years. Four years. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? It's like another world. Tomorrow's a big day. Is it scary? What is it? It has special properties. <sighs> what am I going through? We just need to acclimate. I don't want to acclimate. I want to go. Absolutely not. What's happening? I don't know why you invited us. That's why you look so guilty right now, because you know. We only do this every 90 years. I was most excited for you to come. Okay, uh, this, this one coming up next is from Severn Films. This is Night Killer by Claudio Fragrasso. Yes, everybody knows Claudio Fragrasso. He directed After Death Zombie 4. He had a long and prolific career with Bruno Mattei. Uh, this is also written by his uh, wife, Drudy, uh, Rosalina Drudy. So, yeah, let's hop into this. Night Killer. Um, Really, the background of this thing, why this movie is, you know, Claudia Fragrasso wanted to make a psychosexual kind of thriller, but, you know, it's Italian, and throughout the time of the movie was made, there was big franchises happening everywhere, and there, this movie had reshoots done by Bruno, because the producers made him do it, so what happens is they add these elements of kind of sleaziness, and these girls with big breasts being killed by this mask, this burnt mask killer with a glove on, with a claw, so you're like, ah, oh, Nightmare on Elm Street, and then it was uh, later re titled text gentle massacre three so you're like okay we see where this is going the result is at parts this movie feels kind of like fulci's devil's honey where we have this psychosexual relationship uh you know mask mask uh, tongue twister there but you know like sado uh relationship at times and humiliation and things uh the plot of this movie follows the story of this woman she has uh she's very uh you know kind of a you know has a big sexual appetite and she's very strange. Like in the opening of this movie, she's like taking down her shirt and showing, looking at herself in the mirror. And you're like, this is definitely done to show some some skin. But also, you're getting into her psychology at the same time, and it kind of triggers the killer from the outside. So we have that going on. She, um, this the serial rapist is going around attacking women and raping them, even though they don't really show the rape in detail at all. And you know, but regardless, he attacks this. They just tell you on the news that it's happening. So he attacks her. He holds this woman a hostage for a long period of time. He never see who the killer is because they're wearing a mask and she uh, survives but she loses her memory she can't remember who her family is who her kids are and then come in the world's worst detective and the world's worst doctor somehow they they're just always putting other people's lives in danger through their actions this woman gets kidnapped again uh, by Peter Hooten um, from Inglorious Bastards the original and the Doctor Strange uh, TV movie uh, but yeah so he is also this kind of sadist and he starts to sexually exploit her, exploit her and do weird things. And you're like, is this the same person from before? Yada, yada, yada. Things unfold. Uh, really weird twist, really over the top acting uh, where somebody's going to kill themselves with, you know, involves fried chicken as well. Really weird scene, really weird movie. Uh, very sleazy. But there's these long takes that Fergrasso wanted to do to make it kind of like an arty film, you know, like dolly shots. So it has these elements of well-made 
great filmmaking, but the story is batshit crazy and the elements, of, like the reshoots it added in just make for a bonkers weirdo movie and the twist at the very end. You can kind of guess who the killer is, but there's this crazy twist at the end where you're just like, okay, and then it has a stinger at the end of the movie where you're just like, oh, we're doing that, aren't we? That's hilarious. But it, it is cheap at times. Like there's, there's moments where I was like, is this killer supposed to be wearing the, is he actually supposed to look like a monster or is that a mask? The first murder I could not tell. But on the release... There is an interview with Fergasso and Drudy, and they both talk about how they had a, the falling out with Bruno Mattei, which is interesting, and things like that, and how uh, Fergasso wanted to take this one uh, deeper and do different things with it, but somehow it still managed to end up like that because the reshoots in the production company. But uh, it looks pretty good. It sounds good. The opening is a little grainy, but that's a reshoot from Bruno Mattei, which explains a lot. And it, there's a funny story that Bruno Mattei actually called Fergasso, and he was like, I can't edit this. It's all one or it's all long takes. And he was like, hey, then don't edit it. Uh, leave them so that that's kind of what was happening in this movie they definitely had these two different visions and producers pushing on them but i left a written review over at the screaming toilet page if you want to check it out uh yeah it's enjoyable but it's ridiculous and crazy and definitely one of these uh kind of midnight cult movies or it should be at least uh, that's a night killer made in 1990 from severn films jenny beach police department officer gabrielle here I just got a phone call from a guy spying on me. Was it an obscene phone call? Yes. Did he threaten you? Yes. The poor woman will never be the same again. She doesn't remember anybody or anything. All of the victims were raped before they were tortured, mutilated, and killed by the masked maniac. I just got a phone call from a guy spying on me. Was it an obscene phone call? Yes. Did he threaten you? Yes. <laughs> All of the victims were raped before they were tortured, mutilated, and killed by the masked maniac. Idea geniale. Una pippa mentale di quelle però tremende. Ma non è tanto il rapporto fisico, anche della violenza carnale di due che fanno la ma è uno che ti vuole penetrare il cervello. Okay, this next one is from Arrow Video, and I was like, okay, the chill factor. I, I, it's a horror movie in the snow, so I was kind of in for sure. Uh, this is also known as Demon Possessed, I believe, which I had heard of, and I'd see the VHS floating around. Actually, I like the cover of that one, too. It has, like, the demon kind of possessed behind a snowmobile, if I'm not, uh, you know, messing that up. This movie, okay, you guys remember that, uh, what was the one, uh, Ghost Keeper, which is Rip Off the Shining? That kind of feels like this. We have these, uh, you know, I get uh, snowmobilers that go out and they, they have this weird dichotomy between the group, lots of like sexual, uh, you know, I guess what you say, sexual tension between them. And, and there's uh, six of them, they go out, there's a tragic accident, they have to stay at this cabin and uh, weird things start to happen. This movie is patched together with narration and exposition. Uh, the narration is ridiculous, and right when it came out, I was like, what, what's going on here? The narration basically is telling you everything. It was definitely added on at the very end because the movie didn't really feel complete, I don't think. And then there's a lot of exposition dropping what happens. So they end up staying in this cabinet. One of the Pearsons is uh, fatally injured, they think. Somebody goes away, goes for help, and the rest of them are kind of stranded around this cabin. They find this weird... It's not a Ouija board, but it's similar to a Ouija board where it's a circle thing and for some reason a couple of them know what it is and they're like this is bad news but we're going to screw with it anyways because we're very bored um and there's this constant you know arguing between them very annoying um and what happens is of course they kind of bring a demon back it jumps into the you know the hurt guy and the hurt guy starts to sexually kind of uh, uh pull people's strings and people get killed a couple of the kills are okay a couple of the kills are lackluster they kind of tend to take the most likable characters and pick them off so the most likable to the least likable it kind of and then by the end besides the lead you're stuck with like the one person 
Uh, there is a snowmobile chase, which is kind of funny. There, this movie is not great. It looks good and sounds good, but this is a movie that you don't watch alone. If you watch it with a group, you'll have some laughs, especially with the narration. Like I said, this movie should patch together with narration and a bunch of scenes of exposition where they're like, oh, this cabin was here, and here's some newspaper clippings and stuff like that. Uh, the opening has some funny scenes where they're actually eating at a lodge, and this really ridiculous racist guy says something to one of the characters, and you're just like, okay, whatever. He's, he's 80 yard, and it's obvious. There is some special features on here, which were kind of interesting with a production uh, manager or designer on here. She talks a little bit about the making of the film and about the film's director who is a big, bigger, he was mostly a producer. He produced Hellraiser and he loved horror films. So that's nice to hear. And he would have done movies until the day he died. And I think he kind of, he died. I think he kind of did, but and there's also an interview with the special effects artist on here, which was probably the most interesting thing for me because this special effects artist actually worked on Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. And he talks a little bit about that. And that's one of my all time favorite movies. So he talks about making the Tom Toll's head and getting Michael Rooker the gig. I like that stuff. It's better than this movie, uh, obviously. So, and, you know, I'm not a huge fan of this one, to be honest. It's cheesy and it takes about 45 minutes for anybody to be killed. And they, um, they always like kind of like show like there's going to be skin, but there never is actually skin. And this movie's not good enough to stand on its story really, or it's acting or anything like that. So, yeah, you could have used better kills and some more, you know, TNA of any kind, any sort, just to kind of make you a little bit less bored. I don't want to sound too bad, but if you watch this as a group of people, there is laughs to be had. And I know that they did definitely some of the same production company of Trapped Alive. So it's kind of in that vein, even though I enjoy Trapped Alive a little bit more than this. So that's what you're kind of getting into. Um, I, uh, there is a couple good gags and kills in here. One of the kills was actually pretty solid. If I, I, I liked it, it involved an icicle. It's in the snow. Come on. Can we get some other, like, Killer Snow? I'd love to see Blood Tracks get released on Blu-ray. Blood Tracks is a lot of fun. It's kind of like... I know I'm talking about Blood Tracks. I shouldn't be. I should be talking about Chill Factor. But I'm talking about Blood Tracks because it's another uh, kind of snowy uh, slasher horror film. And um, I think it's better because we get, like, Hills Have Eyes, basically, versus uh, 80s rock glam band. Love that. And also, maybe we could see Iced. I know Iced is terrible, but it's also a very good time. So uh, that's the Chill Factor I was just talking about for, like, <laughs> after I talked about those, but regardless, sorry, I should have stayed on track, but has some nice special features. It looks good and sounds good. So if you're a fan of the movie, this is one I had never heard of really, except I knew demons possessed or demon possessed, uh, the, the cover, but I had not seen it. Um, kind of a lost movie or not really lost. This, you know, definitely underseen. I don't know if it's underrated to say anything like that. Cause I wasn't a particularly big fan of it, but, uh, definitely underseen movie. Uh, the chill factor, the title is ridiculous. Demon possessed. Three college couples take a snowmobiling break in a remote Northwood location. Ooh, some tough guy. After a drag race ends abruptly in a crash. They search for shelter, finding a boarded up children's camp, once run by a murderous religious order. Keep the beast in the field. When the Bible says the beast, it means the devil. And an innocent game with an ancient Ouija board activates the demonic spirit of the cat, which possesses the injured student. I told you it wasn't a toy, damn you! What happened here? It could happen again if the killer isn't put away. One by one, the students succumb to the demon's fiendishly original mayhem. <gasps> Unleashing the horror of a night of murder. going to be a cold day in hell. Demon Possessed. Coming soon from AIP Home Video. Okay, the next one is To Hell and Back, The Kane Hodder Story. This is what, from the Dread Central uh, Presents guys? They released a bunch of stuff. I just finally got to check this one out. Uh, this is a documentary about Kane Hodder, of course. You know, Kane Hodder, a legendary stuntman and actor. He donned uh, the Jason mask four times. He wore the Freddy claw and Freddy, uh, Jason Goes to Hell. 
He's been in a bunch of stuff from the Hatchet franchise all the way early on in his career to being in stuff like Ghoulies 3 and Best of the Best 1 and 2. Kane Hodder is obviously an iconic horror uh, character and uh, actor and everything like that. Everybody knows who he is. So I guess that didn't really make sense how I said that. But he's iconic in the horror community. Let's put it that way. It's a little bit better. So yeah, this documentary kind of shows the early life. Uh, it talks about the early life and it gets really deep in uh, uh, Kane Hodder's story and you get to learn quite a bit about him. Um, you know... To be honest, for somebody to make a movie about them when they're still alive and be like, Kane Hodder to hell and back, I mean, you get a different perspective. It's not easy, um, and, and you think, it, it, people are going to look at it two ways. They're going to be like, well, it's going to be very hard for somebody to go through their story like that. Also, it's got to be somebody with a huge ego. But on top of that, you got to think, his story is interesting to tell, and it should be told because, you know, not many people have lived this guy's life. So it's a very interesting thing. And he's a very likable guy and he comes across likable in the documentary. So they start very early on with his life about him being a kid and him being bullied and things like that. And he gets in depth and he gets emotional about it. Um, of course, it, it goes over all the things that happened to him, uh, a tragic burn stunt and how he got the, the role as Jason with Carl Buechler. And it has people interviewed throughout his career, contemporaries, people that worked with him, childhood friends. So that's that's really interesting. So Buechler's in here, Robert England's in here, The uh, some fellow stuntmen are in here, some childhood friends, like I said. And they all talk about Kane and who he is and things like that. And there's some nice little stories on set here where one of the character, one of the uh, other stuntmen who's in Hatchet 2 says, hey, to another actor, he's like, you better wear a cup when Kane does this stunt. And he's like, why? He's like, because Kane gets a little rough. So they, they talk about his like personality and you get to know him a little bit, like this tough exterior, but deep down on its side he actually is a genuinely nice guy and everything like that even though he plays these monsters you know it's that dichotomy usually the people who play the villains or monsters or seem very violent are actually some of the nicer people and it seems that Kane actually gives back to uh you know the community he volunteers and he goes into burn victim unit uh, places and talks to people. He generally seems like a, a nice guy. He, has, he shows his family and uh, his kids, which I didn't know. I didn't know that real side about him. You know, you never really get to see interviews or talk about his family or kids and a lot of a lot of things like that. So that was really nice to see. Uh, like I said, it's, it's a well put together documentary. It's never boring and it's kind of emotional and you, there is like these cutaway scenes where you see him like standing there, like holding a handful of dirt and it like, it flies out into the wind. You're like, this could be really cheesy and, uh, you could lose some audience. They could laugh, but you're invested enough that none of that stuff ever takes you out where you're like, what, what is this? Like a Creed music video? It, I mean, like, yes, you, you saying it out loud, is very cheesy, but it works in this and you know, there, there's like, it's nice to just, you got to cut away to some things. A lot of times you just don't want talking heads the entire movie. So, uh, you know, there's also scenes of him killing a bunch of people. So that's always nice. And th there's an argue stance where Kane Hodder has killed more people with his hands than any other actor out there or anybody else out there. And you know, if you were talking guns, I don't think so, but hands, I don't know if I could think of anybody else has killed more people with his bare hands, uh, as far as that career. So, you know, there's uh like 90 minutes or not, I don't even know it's 90. It's a long time. It might be 90 minutes of deleted scenes on there. Uh, so if you like Kane Hodder or you're interested in film or horror films or stuntmen, uh, this is an interesting take. And it shows, you know, from his early life all the way up until now. And, you know, it has a bunch of people interviewed that people who like horror films should be interested in. A lot of familiar faces. And then some other people from his personal life that, uh, you know, give you it, uh, you know, part of his life that they other people couldn't give. So I thought it was well worth watching. It's very interesting and it's always entertaining. There's not like these are always like um, stuff that I always enjoy. Uh, uh, movies about filmmaking. So yeah, I enjoyed it. I think it's really cool. Okay. The next one is also by Dread Central Presents, and this is Dry Blood. This one here, right? You know, I started this and I was like, oh, this sounds very interesting. It sounds kind of like it's playing with the mind and, you know, mental illness and things like that. We have this character. He's a very strange character. He has a drug problem, but later on you realize he has more than just a drug problem. He has some mental illness going on. He ends up calling somebody uh, and saying, I need help. Can you meet me at the cabin? And uh, I want to kind of just cool down. I want to get clean again, yada, yada, yada. He goes to this cabin and he's in this small town and realizes it's pretty much him, the person he invited in this small town and two other people, a sheriff and a store clerk. The store clerk is played by Rob Galuzzo from the Shockwaves podcast. And I'm going to be honest, Rob Galuzzo, every scene he's in, he steals a show. He's very funny. Um, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a small performance, but it's a scene stealing performance. It's very funny. Uh, Rob just is a very likable guy in the podcast and everything. So when I hear him, I just enjoy his, he's got a very like soothing voice. And this one, he kind of plays kind of a dick 
And uh, he's perfect in the movie. He's probably one of my favorite parts of the film. The sheriff in the film is probably my other favorite part of the movie. He um, reminds me of a co-worker. Um, the co-worker is joking, of course, but this sheriff is not. He is a big prick, and he notices there's something wrong with this guy who's in a small town. He can sense that he's a junkie, a druggie, something, or recovering, and he just doesn't like him. So he kind of follows him around and puts pressure on him, but he always does it with a smile on his face, which is really condescending and uh, very aggressive and just kind of scary. So... What happens is this guy starts to, you know, be in the cabin and he starts to talk about his life and other things and he starts to discover other things and he starts to think that there's been murders that taken place and this cabin is haunted. He starts to see kind of like dead figures coming out and there's a couple genuinely well-constructed scares in here that I uh, maybe kind of freaked out. And by the end of the movie, you realize what's going on and it turns into kind of a gore fest and pretty brutal and pretty intense, which kind of shocked me. Um, and it's very dark, very, very dark movie and you realize that this person could be trapped inside their mind and not every, you know, and I don't want to spoil too much, but I'll leave it at that. Um, the one thing that really bothered me about this movie is I could never get invested in the lead character. I didn't know if it was his character or his acting or a little bit of both. It's a very, very big, you know, this whole weight of this movie really falls on that character and that actor's shoulders. And if you don't buy it 100%, it does hurt the movie a little bit. And I don't want to point out an actor or anything like that because I don't necessarily think, um, you know, at the end of the movie, it kind of changes things and puts things into perspective a little bit more. But at first I was thinking, oh, this guy's just a, a drug addict. And I don't think he's portraying a drug addict necessarily um, accurately because I I'm unfortunately had some experiences with drug addicts. Um, in my life and usually they're talking about this character being like high on speed or heroin or coke and it's just like i don't know if a lot of drug addicts you know focus on all those different things when they get into the heavy things it always seems like the ones that stick to one thing like a heroin or meth or something like that when this character is just like anything like oh like speed or heroin it just doesn't seem to work for me i don't understand why but then when you learn more about the character you're like oh necessarily you know it just couldn't be that it's a character that's using drugs to deal with something else in their life. And that makes it a little bit better, but it also makes me feel a little bit different about the beginning of the movie and his performance than I did. So it comes at the end. I'm like, do I think he is um, as bad as I thought he was before? No, it's a little bit more complex than that. And I think that I, another viewing would be like, okay, maybe he's, doing something an extra layer that I didn't notice at first and I need to give him props for that. So it definitely would require a reviewing. I don't know how anybody would understand that without seeing the movie and I don't want to spoil too much again, but um, there's a, you know, it's a fairly small cast and besides that, I thought the acting was really solid. Um, and the, the lead the female... I don't think she's as strong as like um, Rob Galuzzo or the the cop. I think those two steal the show, to be honest. Um, but it's a kind of a mind fuck of a movie that involves like d different kind of elements of like is this all in their head? Is there a murder going on? Is this person, um, you know, completely crazy or not? Uh, the gore is intense and kind of surprising and got pretty violent towards the end of the movie. Uh, I thought this film looked kind of strange. Like it has a, it doesn't have like a, you know, it's not a very colorful film. It looks like it's almost drained a little bit of its color. And I think they're going for that kind of thing. I didn't no notice any, it's, it's a good like location to shoot a movie, but like even you think, you think it's more like a Western kind of mountainous area. You would see more like vibrant, you know, oranges and yellows and things like that. But it, it seems a little bit more drained and saturated and depressing. And I think they're going for that kind of deal. But uh, I do think it's worth checking out and uh, for people to decide on their their own how they would like this but this is definitely going to be a, i think it would be a crowd divider um i'm not sure if i i uh, i like it but i don't love it and i think that if i rewatched it i could maybe go one way or the other disliking it or liking it quite a bit so that's dry blood how long are you gonna be on my mountain brian barnes i haven't done anything wrong ah! hey this is brian I'm gonna go up to the cabin, all right? And I was thinking uh, maybe you'll join me. I just really need a friend right now, all right? How long have you been using a gun? Do you know how I know there's hope for you? No. This place. Anna? Hello? a complaint about one of your officers? Did you ever see a doctor about seeing things?
Hey, buddy. You having a bad day? Okay, guys, here comes the first Patreon pick, and this is from Chris Rivers, and he continues the streak of never giving me a bad movie. Cool Hand Luke. Yeah, I've had this Blu-ray for like 10 years, and I never watched it. How horrible is that, really? Like, it was one of these movies where, like, I know I'm loving that. I know it's a five-star movie, five out of five stars. I know it's perfect, but I just held on to it, not wanting to watch it. And he gave me a reason to watch it, and um, it's one of these movies where I do, I'd be like, I should have watched that 10 years ago. I would It would have been in my brain for 10 years, and I would have loved it. Okay. This is one of these movies where you have this kind of anti-hero, anti-establishment kind of character who gets put in a place where he really doesn't belong and he stirs the pot so much and makes brings some happiness to everyone else's life but at a tragic cost and he changes everything and becomes this kind of mythic hero character. Think One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest to a certain extent. Paul Newman is that character in this. He is a war a hero. Um, and, and just to give some, uh, you know, just to basically let you know who this character is before he gets, when he gets sent to this prison, uh, this working kind of chain gang prison, uh, camp, he was doing it for cutting off, cutting off meters, like parking meters, just, you know, drunk one night and, um, Strother Martin, who introduces him, he's the captain in a completely perfect role here. Strother Martin's excellent, wild bunch, hard times, great actor, great actor, um, man who shot Liberty Valance. So he um, tells him, it looks like you have a uh, purple heart, all these silver medals and everything like that. You went in as a, you you got, uh, got those as a sergeant, but you came out exactly how you went in, a private. So that pretty much shows that, uh, you know, he's just not going to listen to the stupid rules and regulations that don't make sense to him. He is anti-authority and, that's kind of the thing of the movie. So he's introduced to this prison camp and there's, he comes in with a bunch of other, you know, new guys, including, uh, Harry Dean Stanton and Ralph White. I believe he says white, but it looks like it's weight. Ralph White's in tons of stuff, you know, stone killer shadows land, um, cliffhanger and Harry Dean Stanton. Do I really need to tell you what Harry Dean Stanton is? Alien Dillinger million movies. Okay. So basically, like I'm saying, this movie is riddled with character actors, wonderful actors, Charles Timer or Timer, however you say his name is in here, Joe Don Baker. Dennis Hopper. Oh, I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of them, but I was just kind of blown away by the cast of this movie. It's like I said, it feels similar. George Kennedy, of course, George Kennedy, can't forget him. It feels very similar to something like One Fall of Cuckoo's Nest, where you have all these characters and each little side character, you know, nobody's a scene stealer because everybody's stealing the scene uh, that they're in. They're all perfect. Everybody's great. And you can tell there's like a great mixture of different characters and attitudes in here. But uh, Paul Newman, right off the bat, uh, butts heads with George Kennedy, who seems to be kind of like, oh, almost like the pit boss of this place, Dragline. He's kind of like, you know, the leader of the criminals, uh, the, the chain gang. He knows how things run, how things operate. So they butt heads and then they become fast friends afterwards. And like I said, you watch this movie and you just see Cool Hand Luke, basically how everybody gets his nickname, how he just kind of gets more disgusted with everything that's going on and the final straw that broke his back. And after that, he decides to escape. And I don't want to get into too much after that, but it's just kind of the story of uh, a very strong soul getting broken and very depressing and very sad and just one of these tales of Americana that makes you realize how screwed up some systems are and everything like that about it. You know, somebody that doesn't really belong there that just stands out and it's just almost like in a lot of ways is like a hero, but or is a hero to somebody that he doesn't really want to be a hero, but he's a hero to them. It's, it's this very complex kind of screwed up situation that's a very, very tragic uh, story. Uh, Lou Excuse in here as well, but it's just marvelously well acted with probably one of the best cast ever assembled, assembled, and it's just perfect in every way. And a lot of these people, it's early performance. Tons of them came out. There's some really funny moments, and you know, like, and a lot of these movies, like The Dirty Dozen or Muffled the Cuckoo's Nest, to get you to laugh with all these characters. And then when something happens to them, it's just that much more impactful. It's perfect. It's a perfect movie. Um, there's some great Paul Newman acting moments when he um, sings after something happens uh, to him, and it's just like, oh wow, that's perfect. Perfect. And he, you learn, he learned that song and learned how to play the, the, the banjo and everything just for that scene. And you're just like, that's so perfect. Um, and just seeing how people, you know, deal with what happens to Paul Newman in here. Uh, there's a, a part where his mother comes to visit him and the, the conversation they have. And one thing she says about, I left the house to your brother. I just, I just never loved him as much as you or something like that. And you're like, oh my God, that's just so deep. And you'll, it's one of those things that goes unspoken in families or anything like that. And they're, they're, they they talk about it here. And it's just like, yes, yes. It's a powerful movie, a classic film. <laughs> it's funny that I'm talking about it even in general. But wonderful, perfect, nothing wrong. 
uh, just uh, undeniable classic, undeniable performances, perfect movie, perfect. being so good to me, Captain. Don't you ever talk that way to me. Never! Never! What we've got here is failure to communicate. What we've got here is failure to communicate. Here. What we got here? Failure to communicate. Is a failure to communicate. Okay, we have another one coming up, Patreon pick, and this is Mary and Max. Uh, yeah, this is a stop-motion film. I had heard about this one for a long time. Again, this is another really heavy movie. This whole freaking episode is filled with heavy movies. We have Miss Selmer, uh, Cool Hand Luke, Mary and Max. We have a couple more coming up after this. Okay, Mary and Max. I don't really know how to go, but this is like equal parts bittersweet. It's, it's like so sweet, but also so dark and depressing that it's just a weird combination that I've never seen ever put together. It's about two pen, uh, pen pals that live completely different places in the world. They're completely different ages and they connect on a certain level. We have uh, Mary, who's an Australian young girl who uh, sees the world in a very strange way. She has two parents. One is kind of absent-minded, doesn't really care, keeps to himself. And one is kind of a alcoholic, strange kind of mother uh kleptomaniac and then we have max who is this agoraphobic almost really kind of lonely he's not agoraphobic the other character in here is but he's this character who just he um has asperger's um and he's not very good with people he's not very good with you know love situations or anything like that and he has an eating problem um tony collette plays mary when she's older and philip seymour hoffman plays max he's from brooklyn or i believe yeah from new york so we have these huge dichotomy of characters and their voices and everything like that so one day out of the blue mary just ends up taking a you know a thing out of a um, phone book and writing to max and they start to write back and forth and they have so much more in common and they start to learn from each other and mary learns a little bit about the world because she has this strange outlook on how things work and they and so does so does max but they say some things that are ungodly funny but equally sad and uh, touching and everything like that and this is this story about these two characters that uh, one lives their life completely and one never really lives their life but 
they they you know they that interaction between them and they never meet in person but they are closer than anything they're each other's best friends and you see a lot of mary grow up and just things like that and it's so sad in a lot of ways but also ungodly touching and the movie to me is really powerful and I was kind of in love with it. I laughed a lot. Um, there's lots of gags in here and the characters in here are really, you know, memorable. The people that they interact with, the parents for Mary and her neighbor who suffers from agoraphobia, this old man. And uh, then we have Max's uh, friend who is this old blind lady who lives next door. And the things they say about each other and the way they look at the world is really fun. And Max can't understand how people don't think rationally and how everything's so irrational, but everybody looks at him like he's the crazy person. And like, it's just very sad. And I don't want to spoil too much on here, but Mary becomes, you know, someone who decides to write about Asperger's disease and they have falling it out. And of course, you know, everything comes together at the end and um, it ends how you would expect it to end in a lot of ways. It's like I said, it's a touching uh, story about two kind of, you know, misfits that find friendship all across the world. It's stop motion, so it's really awesome how they do a lot of this stuff. It's really unique, and the characters are drawn awesomely. There's lots of funny gags in here where how many Max has uh, the goldfish he calls um, Henry the Eighth is at first, and then he keeps getting Henry's keep dying and whatnot. So it's just it's a story about misfits, and also like you know. Even the animals that they both own seem to be misfits and everything around them. And when you see um, Max's life, it's always gray and everything like that. And I, I believe Mary's life starts gray too. But if I'm not, if I'm, if I am not mistaken, I believe it gets more colorful as it goes on. You know, and Max always stays the same. But you know, it, it's just great. I, I have no complaints about it. It was really touching and entertaining, and it could be a tearjerker for some. So uh, you know, check it out for sure. <laughs> Mary Dinkle's eyes were the colour of muddy puddles. Her only friends were the Noblis from her favourite cartoon. She wished she had some friends. Mary had an idea. Dear Mr. Horowitz, I am eight years old. I have a wish to call Ethel. It would be great if you could write back and be my friend. Dear Mary, thank you for the letter. I have never met anyone from Australia. I share my home with a fish, a parakeet, an invisible friend called Mr. Ravioli. People often confuse me. I have trouble understanding them. Maybe this is why I don't have any friends. Dear Max, in your letter you said you had no friends. Neither do I. Can you help me? Dear Mary, do you like chocolate hot dogs? Where do babies come from in America? Do they come from cola cans? <laughs> Have you got a girlfriend, Max? Can you explain love? Be a creep! I find the world very confusing and chaotic. <gasps> Dear Max, I don't think my parents like you. Yeah! People often think I am tacked with some brood. I cannot understand how being honest can be Improper? You are my best friend, my only friend. P.S. Did you know that turtles can breathe through their anuses? Ooh. Hi there, M M Mary. Hi. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do you have a favorite sounding word? <laughs> Mary and Max. Okay, the next one is a Gaspar Noe movie, and it is Enter the Void. Keith Foyt Jr. gave me this one. Oh boy, man. This is an insane movie. Like, I, I talked about Climax a few months back, or a few weeks back, and I don't know... This one, again, two hours and 42 minutes long. 
it opens up right in the beginning, kind of right on the opening. We have the character, the lead character, Oscar, and he's talking to his friend Alex. And Alex basically is saying, before you take that DMT, which is a drug, which kind of has an out-of-body experience to it, you should read the Book of Tibetan or, you know, the Buddhist kind of uh, reincarnation book. And that sets up the whole entire movie. And as you learn a little bit of the reincarnation, he explains to him later on that you kind of are always constantly in the loop out of your body experience and going and fighting constantly until you can enter into a new body, reliving things like that. I don't know how to explain it uh, well, and I don't know how to get it across exactly how the movie does because the movie is very intense and weird and different. It has all the Gaspar Noe kind of camera angles you would expect, except done to the extreme. Instead of going up to like the buildings or anything, we're going up into the sky. So we have two characters. Really, There's a like five or six characters in here, but it follows Oscar who becomes a small kind of drug dealer and uh, right off the bat within the first like 20 minutes slight spoiler kind of a spoiler but it's a whole plot of the movie he is killed and his kind of presence leaves the body and starts to go around and we see everything that happened early on in his childhood he seems to be at what uh, omniscient uh, omniscient or something like that. omniscient yeah i think that's how you say it omniscient uh presence like kind of like all-knowing uh, as a narrator in this all-knowing and everything where he can enter anything and understand anything so he's going into the past he'll go into the sky go into an airplane and it will be his parents in the airplane from years ago and his parents met a tragic end and he has this very close relationship almost in seven to his relationship with his sister and it ties in there's these weird incestuous relationships with father, mother and uh, son and things like that brother and sister and it, it goes into these weird angles and there's this moment where there's these miniatures and he's at one of his friend's house and he mentions man can you imagine all the miniatures of Tokyo because this place takes place in Japan which is really unique as well and he says can you imagine uh, this this uh, this small little miniature world that you've created this this hotel love of all your friends inside just kind of having an orgy and melting together and yes something like that happens but like I said this movie it, it breaks all rules of it all knowing has never been done <laughs> like this much because not only does you see everything that's going on with every possible character we dive into somebody's head and see their dream that they're dreaming exactly and that it's just completely bonkers and insane and a lot to grasp grasp to be honest. We see some kind of sad things, a lot of weird different things that I don't want to say too much about. I think the acting is, is, is it's kind of strange, you know, a lot of it is. I think that um, the lead actor, he's not the best actor in the world, to be honest, but it, it's a strange performance anyways, and the character is constantly high and everything, so it's like, I don't even know how to judge this. But there's lots of sex scenes, of course, it's a Gaspar Noe movie, there's some incredible scenes of violence and there's some really sad moments and going back and, and it's just a way that it's it's when somebody's thinking of sadness or depression or you know it, it's you jump constantly and back like into different times and places and the difference in if you go back into the past and you cut right hard to the future or cut to another thing that happened here and it all mixes together and it just creates these emotions and feelings like I imagine that something like Slaughterhouse 5 the book would how we're jumping around all these different times and and when you see those next to each other it brings kind of all these different meanings and things like that I don't know how to explain it it's a lot of emotions and a lot of things mixed up like that the camera work I said was insane and intense and different uh, the lights are really impressive. I think this has got to be shot on film. It's very grainy and different. I don't know if it's filters or anything like that, but it, it looks unique. It's a very unique looking movie. I don't necessarily know how he got everything to do. There's got to be some uh, camera tricks and CGI and different things like that. But the camera work is always amazing. And I noticed that with him. He always does strange things. But at one point you think the movie's going to just do a complete repeat of itself. But, you know, you see everything that happened to everybody around this character after they die and things like that. Um, there's lots of weird characters and weird things that happen in the movie and just uh, all around a unique and uh, it's, it's a wild, crazy ride, you know, enter the void, you know, and it's about reincarnation and, and, and the mixture of, you know, like drug use and reincarnation, how they kind of go together in a lot of ways and just, lots of weird sexual things at the same time and it's just like the twisted weird unique vision that i've never quite seen all his movies have come across like that to me but i thought it was really great and powerful and there's a couple moments in the movie that just made me um want to cry <laughs> miserable tears of sadness and depression but uh at some time it's a beautiful looking movie too and uh there, like i said 
uh, great stuff, unique stuff, and not for everybody, not for everybody at all. Um, this one, I think, you know, would be best watched by yourself or in a theater or something like that. So to, you know, and, you know, just be kind of sucked into the void that is the movie, but, uh, great stuff, great stuff. <laughs> Okay, the next one is another Patreon pick, and I don't even know what to say about this. This is the Shade, Shade St. John Triggers uh, compilation. This was picked by uh, Michael Brizen, and oh geez, I don't know what to say. Really, I don't. This is some weird stuff that I can't, it's unexplainable to me. It's foreign, it's weird, it's different. It's 30 shorts that this director made, he calls them Triggers, um, and then it's some music videos and some Easter eggs and whatnot. I don't understand exactly what the hell's going on, but I imagine this character that they created is just like drag queen from hell or something like that, or somebody that thinks they're like this old famous actress that's just kind of washed up, or maybe was a weird form, a uh, weird actress that's washed up, or just a crazy person in their house, but it's shot really kind of do-it-yourself and edited. It's definitely a, a stuff that's found in the editing room where there's these weird cuts and they cut back and they repeat and then they'll do different angles and different kind of styles and, and have these weird elements going on. Um, it's about this character, Shade St. John, or Shay St. John, who's really weird and obsessed with, you know, I guess, uh, you know, being famous or was being, was famous. And they have these, these dolls, Kiki and these other dolls that are always around them. And they, uh, Kiki has a burnt face. And uh, it seems that one of these dolls has telekinesis. So this also reminds me of like Taurus Trap where um, uh, on crystal meth or drugs and whatnot, the whole look of it. And this character is constantly playing with their legs, which are these fake legs and saying weird things and repeated things. Um, Trigger Six is the one that just kind of blew my mind because the way they use the music and editing and everything like that actually seemed kind of scary and emotional at times. A lot of these do become very repetitive and to the point where I don't think these are meant to be watched together, all 30 of them. It's just like a mine, mine uh, melted. This is a movie that will either make somebody laugh, it will disgust them, it will confuse them, make them angry, or just gross them out. And I think it could do the combination of all those things. I would say this is the perfect movie to put on if you have a house guest that you want to leave and they won't leave put on this compilation and they will surely leave very quickly. I uh, tried Eraserhead once for that. Uh, it didn't really work, which kind of blew my mind. But, uh, you know, <laughs> this is the new movie that if somebody's at my house and I want them to go home, I'm just going to put this in and see how long. Put the timer on. Okay, are they leaving yet? Because this is something that I don't think a lot of people could, you know, watch for long periods of time. It's unsettling. It's edited very strange. A lot of it's not great to look at because it's so dark and gritty and stuff. And I think that some people will think this is absolutely hilarious while other people will be annoyed with its weird ineptness and everything but it also has these kind of like themes and elements in there that i think that there is something to this character that possibly they were some sort of possible wannabe famous you know character at one point or just somebody who's completely delusional it is just insanity i watched all of it and i still don't really know what to make of it and the weird dolls and stuff definitely reminded me of tourist trap but 
I don't know what to say, to be honest. It's so weird and different. And there's a YouTube channel with a lot of these on there. So if you're interested, check it out. But oh, wow. And there's the way the character talks. It says, oh, make selection on the trailer, on the, um, the menu. Make selection. Pick a selection. Pick a selection. And it's just like... Oh, wow. So weird. So bizarre. So different. I don't know if I could recommend this or not. It's just kind of uh, mind melting. File number M80. Shay St. John's, John's file. file. Something strange is happening to Shay and her dog, Kiki. Hello again. I wake her up to two to tell her to get up to go to school. She beats me out. Hey guys, we're here to do Hammer Time Week 9. The flick we're doing is Night Creatures, a.k.a. Captain Clegg. This was made in 1962. It stars Peter Cushing. It was directed by, uh, don't know his name, but he did a bunch of TV. That's pretty much what he's known for. And it's produced, uh, actually written by Anthony Hines, who produced a bunch of Hammer stuff, and then would go on to write more Hammer things until he died in, like, 2013. I, I looked that up because I was like, this doesn't feel a lot like the other Hammer movies. It's definitely not written like a, by a Jimmy Sangster or anything like that, and it doesn't feel have the Terrence Fisher style at all. So I know that Hammer hoards a lot of pirate films in the past i've not seen any of them and this is a pirate film and it's kind of feels like maybe they tried to mix their a little bit of horror qualities with um you know the pirate aspect uh this one it, do you want to tackle the story of this one or would you rather have me do it um well let's see if we can give it a try so there's captain clegg right yes but we don't know who captain clegg yeah is we don't know who captain clegg is it it, it starts out on we assume to be Captain Clegg's ship. Um, he has a, you know, one of his crew members is um, uh, sleeps with Captain Clegg's wife. He oh, they say his... he uh, attacks her, like rapes possibly, but we yeah. don't really know for sure. Something involving his wife. So so he has his tongue removed, his ears gouged, and he's left on an island to die somewhere. And it fast forwards. And we're at this kind of isolated little island, and we're... Filled with uh, Peter Cushing, who's like, I guess, the uh, mayor, or basically he runs this island. He's, He's the, the priest. priest. He's, He's the, the priest. priest. And uh, the thing about him is he is also a bootlegger. So in come yeah. Britain's uh, soldiers to make sure that they're being taxed properly on their alcohol and booze. What is up with them Brits trying to tax people on the booze? Well, they had representation. We don't yes. know. <laughs> um, uh, but regardless, 
the whole town is in on the bootlegging. Uh, there was a performance in here by young Oliver Reed, his second Hammer uh, film. Uh, he's great in it. He's solid in it. This is third. This is a, oh, yes, this is his third he appearance. Was, he was yeah. in the Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll, and he was in Curse of the Werewolf, so now we have him in uh, a bigger role, though. He's like almost like supporting side. Yeah, yeah, this is so, a major role for him. The twists are fairly obvious. There's a daughter and um, involved and all sorts of things like that that unwind. A young woman who's in love with Oliver Reed, who's the son of the, kind of the, um, I guess you'd call him, what is he, a magistrate or something? He basically runs. He's a law enforcement of the, of the town. But Oliver he, Reed's like the son of like the judge. Or the yes, man. yes. So. They, they give him a name. I, I call them the magistrate. I don't know if that's accurate. Yeah. Or not. But regardless, these British soldiers come on and they know, come on this island and they know something's up. This, uh, this captain has a long history with Captain Clegg and surprise, surprise, guess who's among the crew? Oh, the guy that they yes, the guy that cast they, away, they they cast away, and right away you know where this is going. You know that um, something he he immediately attacks Peter Cushing. So you're like, okay, we know what's going on here, and it's only a matter of time before things are unveiled. Um, the night creatures that they call in this movie are kind of these skeleton like horsemen that attack anyone in the swamp who's late at night. There's that quality hammer swamp mm-hmm. that we all love so much. Um, so you know what's going to happen. You just don't know exactly how it's going to unfold. Um, the funny thing about this one to me is they have these two different sides and you really side with the town, even though they're bootleggers and Captain Clegg was supposedly this awful pirate, but I really enjoyed the town and Oliver Reed and all those people. And I kind of despise the soldiers. Yeah. Like, yeah, the town's doing something illegal. I, I do side with the town, the, the Navy, they... They got like that bad cop syndrome, like that Charlie Bronson syndrome. They where, don't have Charlie Bronson where, like, syndrome. Where they, like they 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 think something suspicious, so they'll get they'll uncover by any means necessary, even what the, they'll like skirt the law. You well, know? that's not what's wrong with Charlie. Yeah, Bron- Charles Bronson is the same. <laughs> Charles Bronson's got the vigilante thing. He's like, no one's gonna do anything about it. <coughs> they'll do something about it. But that's Charlie Bronson. <laughs> These guys work for the man. And these other, they come in and they're like, we're going to take order, we're going to do this, th-. you know, they just, they're never around, I hate them. Yeah. They're I mean, the man. The, the <laughs> Charlie Bronson is not the man, unless like, he's a crooked cop in 10 to Midnight. 10 to Midnight, yeah, <laughs> but 10 to Midnight, Charlie Bronson. Um, <laughs> I know he's guilty, he was masturbating. <laughs> I love that, that movie. That's a great movie, go see uh, it. Um, go see it over... Captain Clegg. Come on. It's... Okay. Um, no, I mean, Captain Clegg's good. The, it's okay. The sets are really cool. Um, there's some, like, pseudo-elaborate plot going on. The guy that played... His, his like... The Undertaker. Oh, yeah, his right-hand man. Yeah. This guy is in a bunch of Hammer stuff and small roles. You'll immediately recognize him. Yeah. And he's actually probably one of the most likable characters in the entire I, I think he is. Like, he, he stood out to me. Like, I know I'd seen him in stuff before that we had watched, but yeah. he, I never remembered him but like yeah. in this one he actually has like some substance he might, he might be my new dr mortimer i don't know <laughs> he's gonna pop up in every one i'm of gonna them. have to remember his name i never learned mortimer's name so what, what do i know he was wolf something wolf something I wolf believe, yeah okay. um but uh, peter cushing really is great in this oh yeah and cushing steals i it. don't understand why they constantly put peter cushing in action scenes like and he's always like it's, it always seems like it's him too. Like he's flying around, and jumping mm-hmm. around, and avoiding things, and putting out fires, and he's always putting these dangerous situations. And Peter Cushing weighs what, one hundred and thirty five pounds, maybe, maybe on a good day. <laughs> soaking wet, one hundred and thirty five <coughs> pounds. But uh, the mystery, you know, it's it's kind of obvious. Some other things are unveiled and they're enjoyable, but really, it, it always has these weird things where you feel like. The guy who is muted, I guess you call him muted, who is at his uh, ears and his tongue cut off and everything, Mm -hmm. like, he deserves justice. But at the same time, you're never sure if he actually did what they say he did in a violent way, so you you don't want to side with him. In fact, you kind of hate him, too. Right, he's kind of got this, like, Quasimodo set up, because he's deaf mute, and... But Quasi was good. Quasi was sweet-natured, Like deep down under all that. I you, You know, I don't know, like... This guy was punished for something he did. But you get the impression that Captain Clegg might have punished him because he slept with his wife. Maybe she was wanted to do it. I don't know. But did she? She died during the. Ch- oh, I don't want to spoil too much. Oh man. Yeah. But we we kind of have all that. But you know yeah. what I mean. Like, you never really find out if he is a rapist or just somebody who was with Captain Clegg's wife. Yeah, he he's a complicated character because. 
I think that Clegg is justified in what... Okay, maybe not justified. I see where Clegg is coming from. He does a 180 and turns his life completely around. He, he is and protects the small Valjean town. from yeah, Le Mes. He is very Valjean. And this, there's very Lemes elements in this story. Yes. I mean, you got the, the young lovers. You got the uh, ruthless pursuit of the law. Yeah. Um, and, and you know what? Javert is a prick. And if you watch that, Javert is, in, is he's, a, he's a very interesting character as they dive deep in him. But... This is really just a remake of the mess of pirates and the night creatures who are um, this, I guess, semi-whore element, Scooby-Doo style thing. Yeah. We know who they are. But, oh, this um, is a very Scooby-Doo yes, story. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's why it's very episodic, the director. Yeah. and the, um, But I always, you always love Val John, so you always side Peter Cushing, the guy who turned his right on. He deserves a second chance. Yeah. And I think that most of the people do admire him by the end of the film. Oh, yeah, they yeah, do. So, yeah. So, um, Oliver Reed's great in it, and there's a great gag. I don't want to call it a gag. It's got that gag. But uh, a gag with the scarecrow. I like the scarecrow oh, gag. Oh, yeah. And they do that thing, too. It's like, was well, somebody in the scarecrow? I like that kind of deal. It, it looks cool. I like the scarecrow. I did like the skeleton they writers cool. when, they, when they showed up. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, something happens with that, and it's... If it's you, still cool, but it's uh, at the same time. If you like, want real okay. skeleton writers, watch Tombs of the Blind Dead. Yeah, okay? yeah. <laughs> the Spanish conquistadores. But uh, this one is good. It's it's fairly decent. Um, it looks great. It um, does look great. I know that the uh, Universal set that I'm talking about on Blu-ray. I guess the radio, the aspect ratios on a lot of those like eight titles. Some of them are not the correct aspect ratio. But I thought this one looked great. I thought the sets looked great. I thought the colors looked great. I thought the, you know, the acting was good. And the mm-hmm. script was okay. It was a little muddled and convoluted at times. Not muddled, but convoluted. It it took a while for me to, like, understand quite what was going on. Well, yeah, because the British guys show up on the ship. And, like, they say something earlier about, like, the trade with French, I think. And I'm like, so wait, 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 wait. What's going on? Are these men French? Because they everybody back in the day speaks in British accents regardless. Re- if it's yeah. an English movie, like, Nazis have the British accent. Everybody has a British accent. And the very sometimes the main Nazi will have a German accent, but it's still in English. So these guys show up and they're like, hey, it's me. I'm like, wait a minute. The, 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 you said these guys were French, Jeremy. These guys gotta be British. Yeah, because, like, like they, they show them and, and they look, like, straight up, like, they're dressed like Napoleon. Like yeah. they got they got the blue. I'm like, well, I thought that the British were like more red, and I thought that they had like a different, well, yeah, yeah, uniform type. Yeah, but like, they were yeah, no, they're they're, they're in the navy. The they're from the navy, though. I don't know anything about the navy. Well, I know a lot about the British navy. I actually, no, absolutely know nothing about the British <laughs> navy. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. Unfortunately, these aren't in the books. Yeah, night creatures get because it's not a horror movie, I guess. Although it is a creature features, it should be in the sci-fi fantasy horror movie guy. I mean, for sure. you know, you have the what what's word your... creature in your title, but you won't have. The and it's word definitely yet. fantasy. Yeah. Where are you at, John Stanley? It's a. Uh, I mean, I don't know. It was okay. For me, I'm going six out of ten. Six out of ten. I'd go. I don't know. I don't want to give it below a three, but two and a half out of five. Five out of ten. That's not five out of ten. Two and a half out. Uh, five nah, out of ten. That's like a two and a half out of ten. A two and a half out of ten is a turkey almost. It's there's no turkeys in this movie. You know exactly what I mean. They like call a bowling it, turkey. A one star movie is a turkey. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Um. No, I mean, I don't know. I, I I have mixed feelings on it. I like it. It picks up in the end, but it, I don't know. I think it's enjoyable. I think it's worth checking out. And I think I told you guys to check out every single one of them. I don't think I've said don't watch any of them. So (laughs) what's that tell you? I like movies. So um, next week will be The Phantom of the Opera with Herbert Lom. I really like that one. I haven't seen it in a very long time. So um, tune in. Uh, Do you got anything else to say? I'm, I'm excited for Phantom of the Opera. Yeah? Yeah, yes. I've seen this one. Yeah, we've both seen this one. Yeah. Um, it's probably the only Phantom of the Opera rendition. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen the originals, which I would be gladly watch those, especially the one with Lon Chaney, Junior Sr. But I could not stomach the Joel Schumacher one. I almost threw up. I had to turn that off. But um, I do. All right. I read the book. <laughs> I just could not watch that movie. So I really like this rendition from the 60s. I believe it's 62 as well. So I guess you guys uh, check out the trailer for Night Creatures, a.k.a. Captain Clegg, which is a much more appropriate title. Do you guys say that hit the bell and subscribe and all that, or do you not do that? I don't do that. But you guys can do it if you want. But if you didn't like it, don't bother. Yeah, See so you guys. Bye. <laughs> Out
did he die, ma'am? Well, Dr. Pepper signed the certificate natural causes, but I should have thought from the look of the poor fellow that he died of fright. This is a frightened village. Here, it is wiser to close your ears to a scream in the night. In this place, even familiar things take on an odd and terrifying significance. A funeral moves under the cloak of night. But no one inquires who has died, nor why the corpses are dispatched with such desperate haste. Starring Peter Cushing, as the parson who knew every secret of the night creatures. <laughs> Yvonne Romaine and Oliver Reed as two young people who loved in the shadow of terror. I've always been respectful to you, haven't I? But I've had to keep my real feelings to myself until now. Patrick Allen as the courageous Captain Collier who sailed the seven seas in search of danger and found it in The Night Creatures. Okay, I guess we're going to hop into the questions. Oh, what do we got? Peter England, although I've seen your reaction sometimes in your videos, um, don't you hate it when you received your order and then you realize the case of the Blu-ray is damaged? What do you do mostly? Make contact with the company you ordered it from? A lot of times I have extras sitting around, so I just replace them. If it was something that was really expensive and really impossible to replace, I might, make a, I might reach out. Otherwise, I probably would just replace it myself. Um, Nick Mua, when did your love for movies start? Um... Uh, as long as I'm about four or five, you know, my grandfather bring down recorded tapes or universal horror movies. So I've always loved that kind of stuff. So, uh, that age, I just was, you know, fascinated with it. How good are you at movie trivia? Have you ever taken part in any quizzes or contests? Not really. You know, I, I'm decent. It's just that I have really good strong points and really weak points at the same time. So like I could get blown away by some things, but then some things I would dominate in, you know, film fans have their, their weaknesses and their strengths. So, um, is it easy for you to weed out fake movie lovers? I'm not really sure what you mean by that. Like, you know, or like people that don't actually like movies. I don't, or people that are like posers. I don't know if I really come in contact with them. I have come in contact with people where I'll be talking to them and I'm like, do you like movies? And they're like, I don't really watch that many movies. And then they'll go to proceed to name like 10 movies they saw in the theater that month. And I'm like, wow, you see more movies in the theater than I have in a year. And, and then the people sometimes will downplay. They don't watch a lot of movies or like movies and they have seen a lot of movies. So, uh, MS, Mad S. Ernest Borgnine as the Beast? I'm not sure what he's getting at here, but does he mean Ernest Borgnine as Beast from the X-Men? I would actually like him as the Beast in X-Men back in the 70s. That would be awesome. Okay, then we have some answers. Uh, what was the question I asked? Um... Oh, have being a cinephile ever got you in trouble? Peter England. To be honest, I was always a loner when it came to movies until I met a guy in the mid-90s who thought and talked exactly like the same like me about movies in general. He became a very good friend of mine. Still haven't met anyone like him. But nowadays with social media, Facebook, for instance, you can share your thoughts about movies with so many people around the world, including you, and that's great. And uh, he's going to give an answer to an old question. Still want to give an answer to the 5 out of 5 question. My most recent 5 out of 5 movie has got to be The Hateful Eight. And then we have 81 Oak Ridge. He's giving one to the old question. And the last 10, 10 out of 10 movie I've seen is Hereditary and The Autopsy of Jane Doe. I think both films will stand the test of time and gain popularity years, as the years go by. Uh, Dead Flintstone. I love that name. <laughs> I think I have an illness when it comes to movie shirts. I have a ridiculously large collection of cult and horse shirts, and I dread to think how much I've spent over the years. I just got the Santa Sangre shirt. Good purchase. Nick Mua. I got into a spot of trouble because of my love for film. Somebody once said that they didn't want to watch movies with me anymore because I ruined the experience for them with all my knowledge about films. They felt I saw just about every movie there was and they were watching uh, vicariously through me. Ah, they said they felt as if I had seen every movie and was vicariously living through them. 
Uh, Professor Scraggly, I didn't quite get into trouble, but my final year of high school, I bought my DVD of Poultry Guys to art class to show some friends because they didn't believe it was a real movie. It was a slow day, and my teacher came by and kept insisting to play it in the background for the class. I continued to tell him how it wasn't suitable for school, but he didn't let up. I felt like I was having a panic attack every time he came to my desk to ask more questions about the movie. <laughs> he should have just put it in. Uh, screw it, right? I think I uh, had him watch Dawn of the Dead around Halloween one time, and we forgot about the nude scene and like the director's cut. I think it's with uh, Galen Ross. But I guess, oh, you know what? I'm going to ask you guys. My hair looks ridiculous. Like, I don't know why. I always worried about my hair. Like, I don't know. I think I blue dry it too long, so now it just looks like I'm wearing a wig. It literally looks like I'm wearing a wig today. I swear. Okay, question of the week. Um, one book you want to see made into a movie or one movie you were surprised was from a book? I know, like, because I always watch these old 70s movies, and it's, like, based on the book by. I'm like, this is based on a book? But, uh, so, basically, one book you want to see made into a movie and or one movie you are surprised was from a book. I guess we're going to hop into the update now. It is super short. Okay, this is going to be super quick. I guess I'll show this T-shirt first from the Severn. I got this, uh... This rainbow-colored Severn shirt. Looks pretty cool. Love Severn, so grab the t-shirt. Don't think I have a Severn shirt. And I got uh, the V, or Vi, which I have seen a while back. And this is a Russian uh, film. Very weird, very crazy, unique. Uh, sure to be rediscovered after Severn released it and have a lot of people talk about it. I originally heard um, Rebecca McKendry talk about this one on the Shockwaves podcast. So, yeah, cool movie, cool movie. And I guess we're going to hop back to the video. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, you guys have a good one.